So, uh, without further ado, I'll introduce Noel Gallagher. Hello. Let the battle commence. to my management I'm not even asked if this never comes out do you know what I mean I just want to make this record it's very liberating and it reminded me of the time doing definitely maybe because you haven't got an audience an old Gallagher audience what is that I don't know yet we'll find out it was a great feeling and there was no internet forums I haven't got a website nobody can contact me I don't contact anybody else the only people that knew I was making a record was the wife and my manager and it wasn't even like we're making a record, it was like we're doing these songs for me. searching for it and I know when I get it sometimes I don't know how to get there but when I hear it I know what it sounds like I'll always say yeah it's finished they're never finished they're either wrong or right I've never been in a studio ever with no material and just gone in and said, oh, I've got this idea. To go in the studio and set the amps up and just, yeah, man, we just went in and just fucking played, you know, whatever, was all, that's not art, that's, to me, that's not art, that's just fucking about. To me, art is writing it and rewriting it. To get from a point of playing the first chord to listening to it at the end, there's got to be some kind of emotional journey between you and the song. It can't just be like fucking a thousand percent inspiration. It doesn't work like that for me. One, two, three, four. I guess I'll always be from here on in the job in Minstrel, do you know what I mean? I've got the acoustic guitar and we'll try and write great songs. Sometimes it happens and sometimes it doesn't. I like the kind of the discipline of that. It's like, this is what I've got. I've got no band. How am I going to do something new with this? <laughs> the themes that are running through it for me are kind of romance and young love and escapism and the longing to leave one place and be in another. All the songs are quite emotional and they deal with real human emotions, whether it be love. There's not a lot of loss on the record. There's, there's love and hope. I think hope is one of the key words and love and um, I don't know what the term is, but of the journey, do you know what I mean? To, to, to pass from one place to another. That seems to be the main themes for me personally. <laughs> do 
with life in the big city, um, relationships between young lovers, really. You know, with like the death of you and me, if I had a gun, everybody's on the run. The song's about companionship between two people and kind of like, let's get out of here, man. This is kind of getting a bit too heavy for us, kind of thing. To me, it says something in it that I've never said before. It's like, you've got to be strong enough for love. It's very easy to be cool and cynical. And I'm one of the biggest cynics that there is, you know. But it's very difficult to just let yourself go and kind of, you know, to be in love. You've got to be strong enough for that, you know. And this, we go to this place in Twickenham. It's like an old 60s studio, it's got all vintage equipment in it. The day that I started, I was halfway through and my, my wife rang. She calls me and says, well, guess who's pregnant? And I'm like, fuck, wow. So I'm like, fucking, you're making a baby and I'm making an album. Wow, why'd you get your head around that? What a Great, and then we kind of got some backing tracks done. Had a month off. Went back in the studio, done a few more, had another month off. Went on holiday. Just took a real kind of foot off the gas and just listened to it, which is a great thing. I listened to it for whatever it was, maybe six or eight months or something like that, while we were getting ready to move out and Sarah was getting ready to have the baby. So it gave me a real kind of perspective of what I wanted to do with it in the end. But I saw him go through a different kind of struggle. He's got to sing the whole record. And actually, I think that's the thing that he's really um, had to deal with, is that he's singing every song on the record. And that's quite a tall order because, because he's never had to do that before as such. When I heard If I Had a Gun, that to me was pure no. The lyrics are the best that I think he's written. If I had a gun, I'd shoot a hole into the sun. The love would burn this city down for you. Well, the delivery of it is going to be a lot more heartfelt. I think when you when you finally you finally step up to the to the microphone and and, and think. Right, well, I know what this song is about. I don't have to explain it to myself, and I know, I know where it's going, and I know what the point I'm trying to get across at whatever point in the song that is, instead of just somebody singing like this but reading the words down off a sheet of paper that don't mean anything to them. That's going to come across inevitably. My eyes have control over the music that I make. I don't, I'm not adept enough as a musician to go into a studio and say, you know what, I want to make a fucking jazz album. I can't do that. All I can do is sit with a guitar and wait in hope for something to happen. And that's what I do, you know. I call it going fishing. I sit by the river with the guitar, and if I get a catch, great. And, it, I, and that's what I do. It comes from somewhere within. It's not, I can't, I'm not brilliant, I'm not, I can't read music, I'm not, I'm not a great guitarist, I'm not a great singer, I'm not, a gr I'm not great at anything. You know, I'm great at being me and doing what I do, and that's it, you know. You don't think of people as artists as being afraid, but once the lifestyle is created, it, people become very afraid of losing that, and then so that starts to infect their creative decisions if they're, you know, if they're making mistakes. I think that's kind of the killer creatively is when people are afraid of trying things or afraid of taking risks. One of the reasons why I say working with Knowles, he's one of the most positive, creative people I ever work with is because he absolutely works from a place of zero fear. I was in America. It was at the height of some fucking war or other. 
And I seen a thing on the news program where a family had been told that their son was dead. And after it, this letter they'd written had, had, had arrived home. But they would never open this letter. It leaves the letters in the mailbox. And they were kind of religious family. And they say, no, he's not dead. He's just gone to heaven on his holidays. And I was just like, wow. She will kiss the sky. It was a good work with Dave right at the end who hadn't heard the songs. I kind of sent him the tracks and he said, it's great, but I need to come to London and speak to you. And I was like, well, when are you going to be in London? And he said, I'm not, I'm just going to come in for the night, we're going to talk about it. I was like, all right. And he's going, right, I'll be there next Wednesday. All right, and I was thinking, all right, well, he's not coming over to tell me it's brilliant. That's for sure, because he can do that on the phone. So he's coming over because he wants to lay some on me, and I wasn't quite sure what it was. I mean, I don't think anybody wants to hear when they think they're finished and somebody, and they're saying to somebody, hey, we're done, you want to help us polish it off? And the person you're asking to has, like, much more serious concerns about it. I don't think it's a phone call or an email. get there and we buy the studio and we play the track the, the rough mixes that I'd done and he was going this is great but we've got to redo the drums and I'm like what the fucking drums listen to the song so this went for about six or seven tracks and I kept saying who cares about the drums take the fucking drums off and have a tambourine it's what listen to the tune the only reason to have a producer is to be focused on the things that are external to the creative internal process and I think that's a hard thing to do. Noel's actually incredibly good at it, but I thought there were a couple things that um, could have been better and basically told him that. That's when I decided that, yeah, maybe I shouldn't be a producer because he was going, look, your job's already done. Those songs are great. The end. My job is now to make it sound amazing and we've got to redo those drums. It wasn't really about the drums. It was basically about my impressions of the whole recording. I was a little bit crestfallen at the time because I was thinking, oh, God, it's like pulling the foundations out of an house to build a basement, but I so knocked the house down, do you know what I mean? I was going, how's it going to work? And he was going, oh, I can make it work. solo record once and I think it was like to his credit I think he was like you know not what he wanted to hear but he completely came on board I think it took him like a day or so or maybe not even by the end of the day he was like okay what do we need to do I couldn't comprehend what on earth he was going on about so we go out to LA take Jeremy the drummer the same drummer and I was saying, do you know what he's going on about? And he was going, I don't know what he's fucking going on about. And, I, and then we were going, do you want him to play the same thing? And he was going, yeah, 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 he's got to play the same thing. But, you know, it sounds like a load of guys who've never heard a song before. And at the time, I'm just listening to the song going, it's fucking amazing. Does it, you know, oh, it's great. It took Dave to say, sounds like two guys playing in a room reading it off a sheet of paper. And I'm like, ah. And we were in Sunset Sound in LA. And, you know, we put the first track up, which was Everybody's on the Run. And off he goes, and the drums come in, and through great teeth, I have to admit, it sounded fucking amazing. <laughs> days in the studio just you know let's try this i don't have to pass the guitar to anybody else now or i don't have to wait for the bass player to show up because his fucking cat's got a cough or something do you know what i mean it's just like bang 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 and then you listen to it at the end of the day and you think well it sounds great we can make it better tomorrow i mean for me it was probably the most fun making a record i've maybe ever had it was just noel trying to find how to get you know how to get the best performance out of himself and it was it was just easy and positive and fun and kind of amazing no, I think it's an incredible album, um, and everyone I think involved, who, including him, is happy with it. So you know. I 
get sent on the tracks, they give you a call and say, well, we've got choir practice on Tuesday. We've done some stuff, do you want to come up and listen to it? And you're like, all right. You go to somebody's house, it's a kitchen in Crouch End. It's actually someone's house. There's actual fucking pets in this house and kids watching telly. There's about 20 or 30 people. Well, the full choir can't come tonight because, you know, um, blah, blah, blah. There's just going to be a few of us. So I kind of, oh, he's got the chair for you here. And like, come on, I'll just stand at the back. I'm cool, man, you know what I mean? And they're like, no, 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 you've got to come down and get you got the choir all around you. And so they're all kind of like yeah, school teachers and fucking, you know, accountants and all that. They all kind of sat on this chair and they're all staring at you. And then they start singing your song, you know. <laughs> but it sounded great. It was great working with them. Nice people. They've done a great job. Shining on me to get back what they've taken from me and build a little fire where it's cold. For a year and a half, I hadn't said a word. I was kind of amazed that nobody knew what I was up to. Fucking walk into Sunset Sound the first day, there's another band in there. But I could just tell they were English by what they were wearing. And there's a, like, a communal courtyard, and I was kind of sat outside on a cigarette, and they were up having their lunch. 18 months of, like, fucking bliss goes out the window in one minute when the singer decides he's going to tweet. Wow, in the studio with Noel Gallagher, he's blaring out his new tunes, absolutely amazing. That goes on Twitter. Within 20 minutes, there's a deluge of fucking... Are you in L.A.? What are you doing in L.A.? Why are you in L.A.? Phone calls going fucking berserk. Man, I was like, well, what are we going to say? I was like, don't say fuck all. Just don't, don't confirm or deny anything. You know, and I was thinking, you spotty little fucking her, but mind your own business, do you know what I mean? Make your own fucking record. Don't, don't worry about mine. <laughs> Sunset Sound for a week or two doing that, which if anybody's listened to this and they've ever recorded in Los Angeles, then you'll know that is pretty much living the dream as a musician. Walking up Sunset Boulevard every day at like 11 o'clock, going to work and walking back down at 11 o'clock at night thinking, just give me my stripy trousers and I am back in the 60s. This is it, mate. This is it for me. about, you know, things that you love but are bad for you. Drinking, women, smoking, hero worship. But thinking, but aren't those things fucking great, you know? Sausages, bad for you, but far, I defy anybody, apart from Morrissey, not to be down with the sausage. I was just sitting fucking about playing it, and I thought, actually, the way I was doing it sounded a little bit straight. I had the chords and I think I had the words fully formed in the melody and it was kind of in that shuffly death you and me thing and it was kind of a bit kinksy and it was and I was thinking mm, sounds all right and then I don't know why I was I don't I don't know where I heard strings of life by rhythm is rhythm but that piano thing at the beginning came on it could have been on the radio it could have been just playing around the house I don't know what it was I think it's in the same key and I was like could it fucking work like that and I got the guitar out, and I was like, I convinced myself it could work. So I'd done a little little thing into a dictaphone where I played the guitar in that kind of style and then kind of sang over the top of it to myself and thinking, fucking that's great. So I booked a studio immediately in Dean Street. There was just me and a guitar and I brought a bass, I didn't, no drummer. Kind of got a drum machine out and we'd done the drum pattern. Can anybody have played the piano? 
there's one engineer kid who was just making the tea. You know, I could play the piano a bit, and I dragged him in, and I told him what I wanted. He played it, we sampled it, and over the course of a day, he was like, fuck, this is going to work. This is fucking brilliant. <laughs> turned out great. I don't know what I'm going to do with it live because I can, I can only dance when I'm drunk. I don't intend doing gigs drunk, so I don't know what's going to happen, but it could be embarrassing. Where are we going? <laughs> <laughs> Maybe! <clears throat> Maybe! Fucking right. Here we go. Pray for the car. Maybe! slave to whatever songs I've managed to pick out of the river, you know. Luckily for me, a load of songs came along that lent themselves to kind of different instrumentation and different ways of singing, different arrangements and not the standard stadium rock thing. song like The Death of You and Me, great, that just happened. And the more I listened to it, the more I thought, oh, fucking, I, can hear New, I can hear New Orleans in this. I can hear the rain in it somewhere. And I can see the guys walking, uh, you know, doing the goose step thing through the French Quarter. I can see it, you know. How do we get that onto record? <laughs> place on the record where there it may sound like a horn but it's not a horn it's it's Noel singing or it's a combination of Noel singing and a horn I don't know a few different spots actually when I would have done I'll have done that I will have done that and I'll have done all the brass parts I call it a mouth trumpet Dave calls it goat calling that was when he's kind of going wah 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 that's the that, kind of doing a trumpet sound from a hall very far away. It, it sounded like he was calling a goat from the top of a mountain. <laughs> Sounds ludicrous, right? And then we mix them all together so they sound like a brass part. Right, well, let's get a brass section. And, uh, these, the, and those guys with the, and the, the brass on that, they're three guys from Bristol. And they fired up and it was like, fuck me. You know, wow, that's incredible. <laughs> sound it was just kind of a mock-up for what a trumpet would do and then it just we never really beat it so it just wound up staying in apart from what a life the other nine songs i can sit and play on the acoustic guitar and they're just as powerful and they're just as direct and they mean as much and they're just as valid versions yeah he is totally receptive to suggestions but um but what happens is that something will have a little bit of a life for a second on the track and then it'll go away. Um, and he always goes back, he likes to go strip it back and go back to certain basics. The guitar and the tambourine and the vocals, that's 90% of the song. You know, the rest of it is just making it as good as it can be. I think uh, from a writing point of view on a few things I think he has been honest, yeah. When you're 20 you can write about things that don't exist. When, when you're 45 you've got to write about things that mean something to you and you know, you, you've got to say something about your experiences. Or you, you can still make you can still make shit up. I kind of looked out with all the words. I, I I really liked them all, and they were quite effortless to write most of the words. And I think they've all got a certain kind of power and meaning to them. Dream on is fucking nonsense. Oh me, oh my. I'm running out of batteries I'm hanging from a ladder The 
came on is pop for pop's sake. The words just serve the music and the tune, so it doesn't really matter about the words. It's going to be the last track on the album because you can't go anywhere after that. I wrote that in Thailand in 2001. Right, so it's 10 years old this year. For whatever reason, it's never been finished where anybody, least of all me, has gone, I'm really happy with it, I love it, let's put it out. Well, there's at least three versions of it on the internet. One acoustic, one kind of a bit more beefed up, and then another full band version. So when it came to do this album, I thought to myself, right, if I don't record this song now, that's it, it's never coming out. <laughs> Twat putting a song on an album that's 10 years old, plus a song that's had so much of a build up with Oasis fans. But I've got to say, when I was recording it, I was like, Yeah, sounds alright, mm, sounds alright, put the choirs on, yep, sounds pretty good. It was only when my mate referred to him as Strange Boy, because that's his nickname, played that guitar solo at the end that I went, I fucking love it, that's it, it's done. <laughs> done this other solo and he went, why didn't you do that on the end of Stop the Clocks? It needs to be slightly melodic, slightly controlled, but slightly out of control, you know, sort of all the opposites go. my manager saying after 10 years and 11 separate versions stop the clocks finally finished and he was going on but I won't believe it until it's fucking in the shops. In Oasis the benchmark was set within the first two years and fucking God bless us we tried and tried and tried and tried you know to climb those mountains again and it was just like in the end I just accepted that they were just two moments in time forget about it let it fucking go. So I haven't set the benchmark. A year from now, there'll be a benchmark and it'll be like, right, that's that, you know, and it might be, the benchmark might be down by my ankles or it might be way above my head and it may exceed everybody's expectations or it may just be all right. It may just be another album. We don't know yet, but that's the great thing about it. Who knows? <laughs> I didn't have any expectations and I just thought I'd just let it see what see what happened with it. So we started off in really small clubs and then it got bigger and bigger and bigger and ended up in arenas, you know. The tour was one of the longest tours I ever did. It was 15 months. There were great nights every night and I guess it's because I don't know whether the crowd had any expectations or I didn't have any expectations. It just happened and then when it finished I was like, fucking hell, you know. I thought I'd kind of tolerate it, being centre stage and being a singer every night. As it got further on, I really enjoyed it. With 
previous tours in Oasis, let's say, there would always be so much chaos and just bullshit surrounding it that it would be great to get away and just get back home and shut the front door and just forget about it. There's just something in me now feels different than what it did then. I had about six months off, which is something I probably won't do again. I got bored really, really quickly. Going in the studio on my own is a far more pleasurable experience than going in the studio with five, six, you know, seven other people who are all songwriters and all have a democratic and legitimate say about how things are going to be. That in itself creates, you know, lots of problems and all that. But when you, when you do it on, on your own, you're doing it on your own terms and at, and at your own leisure and your own pace. And it's, it's a lot more enjoyable. I think. I started by going in and recording the songs that were left over and old songs that have been hanging around for a while, songs from the last sessions that were kind of left over and old stuff that back from Oasis days that I never got around to recording. Because I run my own record label and I do everything and I, I make the record myself and all that, there's not really a definite starting point. Again, I don't want to keep going back to Oasis days, but that's all I've got to kind of compare it against. But back then, it, you know, you would get an email of someone saying the studio's booked from here to here and this is when we're going to go and do it and we'll kind of see you there, you know. Uh, it's not like that now, it's kind of, I kind of make all the decisions and kind of fall into it. The start of it was, it was a pain in the ass. We started just doing demos, you know. He went away to see his friends in America to see if he would redo them maybe fix them up and improve and perfect maybe a bit more. I went to LA, which is where I've recorded my last four or five records. And Dave Sardi, who produced the last record, he didn't want to do it. And he it was a kind of a bit of a shocker, really. Played him the stuff and he was like, mm -hmm, you know. And I remember coming out of the meeting and saying to my manager, I'm not really sure he was into that. A month later, he said he didn't want to do it. So I was looking around for a producer for what seemed like a lifetime. I've seen a few people and they didn't want to do it either. <laughs> but it was a bit of a kind of wake-up call. I'm thinking, fuck hell, you know, I'm going to have to do it on my own, you know, which I've never done before, and which has turned out to be a major pain in the ass. <laughs> I've got a great engineer in my old mate, uh, Paul Stacey, who plays bass on a lot of the records. I started working with Noel in 97, with Oasis in fact. I auditioned as a keyboard player, because I didn't have any work as a guitar player. To my surprise, it worked. I went to the audition and in five minutes he said, you'll do. He plays keyboards and guitar, we kind of, so me and him and his twin brother, who's my drummer Jeremy, effectively made the record between the three of us. <laughs> I'd met him before because obviously my twin brother played with Oasis and worked with him. He'd come and seen a couple of gigs with my brother and I. I think that's when he worked out that he might be interested in me playing drums for him. I'm very lucky to have those two because they're great musicians and they've got a great knowledge of music and all kinds of different music. And I can talk to them in a very rudimentary way about what I wanted. And they, and they got it. Well, we seem to have a good musical connection. He is actually quite specific. It's actually quite easy for me because I get a very clear picture from him of what he wants on the drums. But then obviously I've got to be able to, to interpret that. He has, you know, at times also not been sure exactly what he wants or he's said something and hasn't quite worked and then he's let me try something. So yeah, it's very easy. I think we work very comfortably together and uh, it's always good fun but we get the job done very quickly. Producing your own albums, you know, nobody tells me what to write anyway or what direction it should be going in or any of that. What I found difficult was actually managing the sessions from one end of the week to the other. You know, sometimes you'd start on a Monday morning and get to Friday, 
and you'd, I'd be going home on the tube or something and thinking, what have I actually done this week? I couldn't keep up with it all. Whereas producers, they have a system. They know how to manage sessions and session musicians and backing singers. And this person's coming in that day and that person's coming in this day. And I found that difficult and a waste of energy. I'm not used to people kind of looking to me and saying, right, so what are we doing today? I wouldn't recommend it, it's a fucking pain in the arse. This one was more relaxed in the sense of that I think we didn't try to perfect things so much. You know, most records nowadays, everything's airbrushed, you know, it's just the way of the world. And perfect records, is, that's not what music's about to me. This one has got a bit more soul and life in it because we didn't go that route. The recording process, um, working with Noel and with Paul Stacey was very interesting. It's, it was very funny, very organic, very cool and just, you know, I, I like to take, get, um, taking direction from Noel because he's um, an artist that definitely knows what he wants to hear. In the case of outside musicians, like outside session musicians, I barely know what the chords are on the guitar, let alone musical styles. I don't, I don't really know any musical terms. I can't articulate it in words. I can only do it in sounds and playing other people's records and saying, can you do something like that? It's really nice to work with people who know what they want and, and not kind of just flimsy. And... So after working on the last album, I knew what to expect um, working with Noel. I got to the studio and there was just two people there rather than what I thought would be 10 or 20 people. And it was a really relaxed atmosphere and Noel's so easy to work with, as is Paul. I already knew what harmonies I'd have to do, so I went into the booth and um, beforehand and afterwards we would have lots of chat and banter and funny stories from Noel, which is uh, great fun. It's very charismatic. We've been friends for 17 years, so I've said the odd thing that I thought, and you know, some things, you know, seem to sprout, and some things don't. We're doing some track, might have been on the last record. Probably what a life. I was going to get somebody like a professional dance person in to do it, and he was saying it'd be much better if we try and make a dance record because then it'll be fucking. Then it won't be that. It'll be our version of it, you know. And he was right, and it's the same with some of the tracks on this. If I'm trying to do jazz or space jazz or fucking, you know, um, disco, if you get, you know, Nile Rodgers in, it'll sound like Nile Rodgers, you know what I mean? If you're pretending to be someone else, then it sounds a little bit fucked up and weird and a bit wrong. I thought it was good sound advice. That was advice I've adhered to ever since. <laughs> Anything is on the table when I'm writing and recording now, anything. When you're in a stadium rock band, it's stadium rock and you're not going to hold the attention of 80,000 people at Wembley Stadium with intricate arrangements and blah 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 and all that. When you're on your way up, you're kind of, you're eager to please and you're eager to get it done and be fucking huge and I don't know, mate, yeah, no, I just don't care, I just don't care anymore what people say. A song can go anywhere now, you know, anywhere, and I'm, I don't really feel like I've got any inhibitions about jazz or, you know, disco that I would have had maybe 15 years ago. Well, they're just different times in your life. Definitely maybe it was written by a young man, it sounds like it, you know, this, this record was written by, you know, a middle-aged fucking geezer, which sounds like it at all. Riverman, we were all really, really excited when, when I finished it and when it got to the, the saxophone break, it was a case of, shall I actually get a saxophone player? You know, it was just like we phoned this guy up, we played for Primal Scream and down he came and we played in Wish You Were Here and a few other Pink Floyd things. The, the Wish You Were Here from, by Pink Floyd was one of the reference points we, we talked about when we went in and I think the fact we ended up using baritone on it, sonically it very much takes it you know, into that kind of psych rock avenue. <laughs> Thank you.
When he'd finished and we'd picked the perfect one, it was a real kind of, wow, that's fucking incredible. Then the album became something different. I will be accused of uh, sex crimes, sexual harassment, uh, when the album comes out, but I uh, fucking love it. My missus, for instance, was just like, when it got to the bits, she just said, I fucking hate saxophones. Why do people hate them, though? A lot of fucking great, iconic figures in music, you know, like, you know, the, the jazz, the jazzers, you know, all play saxophones, don't they? I think the saxophone has uh, got somewhat of a, uh, a malign sort of reputation that, that stems from what I would say some serious cases, some serious uh, crimes against music committed, you know, in the 80s and early 90s, it, it wasn't used in a great way. And to a certain extent, I'd say the saxophone has been on probation, but everyone deserves a second chance. For every Kenny G, there was a John Coltrane and a Charlie Parker, so, you know. No, I think, I think we deserve a second chance, put it that way. When you're listening to it, don't think about the guy from Spandau Ballet, right? Don't think of that. Think of some fucking guy smacked out of his fucking head in New Orleans in 19 fucking 63 or something. Think that. Don't think of through the barricades or fucking <laughs> true. Please don't think of that. Think of something more druggy than that. The interesting thing with Noel is that he's, he's got great taste and he's always playing me very interesting, obscure tracks that, you know, I'm always like, wow, where did he, where did he find that? And I really feel that this album, he's, there's, he's incorporated that side of his taste, it, or he certainly started to with this record. So it's, uh, yeah, I mean, and that, and that particularly the right stuff, I think that has those elements in it. And it was great fun to play as well. Coming to the end of the sessions for this record, we came up one track short with all the B-sides and all that. It was, it was a long, sprawling kind of eight, nine minute thing and it had loads of fucking saxophone on it and it was way out there. I went home one night and listened to a rough mix of it and thought if I, if I edited it down, it would sound more concise and a bit more like a, a song as opposed to like a jam. And it's, it's fantastic. I got it's one of my favourite ever pieces of music. The lyrics, you know, again, you and I got the right stuff. I guess it's a direct conversation between two people. And it was an afterthought and it was going to be a B-side until it came out so great in all its glory. It was like, oh, that's definitely first track of side two. No fucking way. Playing on the right stuff was great fun actually. It's got a brooding, atmospheric kind of quality to it. It was actually Noel's idea to bring bass clarinet. The closer to the edge I got with my playing, the more he was enjoying it. You know, that I actually wasn't quite in control sometimes, but you know, Noel seemed to get off on that, which was nice. I couldn't be uh, <laughs> any less spiritual jazz sitting here in front of you today. That's not the first thing you think of when you see a picture of me. Okay, so like a fucking jazz dude there, man. It's a fucking, hey man, he's a cool cat, man. No, I don't know where it comes from, you know, I don't know. My mate Lawrence actually, when he first heard it, I think he might have used the words finally. He went, finally, fucking hell. I don't know what he meant by that, but. I've been working with Noel for the last, or on his last two solo projects and to the latter part of the um, Oasis days. Um, I started working with Noel on the um, Don't Believe the Truth album for Oasis and then I've worked with him ever since. A good relationship with Noel photography wise, he's got a good idea of, of imagery and then he, he lets me sort of get on with it and um, 
either location wise or, or with ideas and normally we come back with something good. So Pictures for the new album began with something that Noel came back with. He found some funky little boxes that oscillated and messed around with wavelengths and projectors. He bought a couple off the internet and gave me them to um, go off and play with by feeding music through them. It affected the wavelengths of um, the projections or TV images. It didn't, it didn't take that long. I think we spent an afternoon. And we did about two, two and a half hours of projections. And we've got, we've got lots of different backgrounds and different effects out of them. Listening back to it when it was finished, all the songs are kind of still about the same couple who are still searching for something. I don't know, I don't know why, I'm, I'm kind of in a, in a place of songwriting at the minute where the songs are very direct about a me and a you, or um, a him and a her, or a him and a him, you know, whatever. It's not intentional in any way, but when I listen back to the, the album when it was finished, all the songs are about relationships still. The big difference on this one is there's a lot more guitar solos. On the last record there was one, I can recall. There might have even been two. On this album, I think out of the ten tracks, nine have got guitar solos in them. That wasn't really a conscious thing, was to make more of a guitar record. That's just what the songs dictated on the day, you know. Followed you down to the end of the world Wait outside your I tried to get Johnny Marr to play on the last record. I wanted him to play on What A Life, and he couldn't do it because he was busy doing something. So on this record, I called him and I said, can you come up, I've got this track, can you come and play on it? And he said, uh, he said yeah, 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 okay. Well, I said, oh, I'll, send, I'll send you the, the, the rough mix. And he said, no, 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 I don't want to hear it. I'm just going to come and I'll just kind of react to it on the day. And I was like, fucking hell, that's brave. I said, can I even give you any pointers? And he said, no, I don't want, don't even tell me what it's like. And he, you know, he arrived on the day, two guitars and a bag of effects pedals, and off it started, and he kind of went, oh, fucking hell, mm. Oh, wow. He said, oh, I didn't know it was going to be like this. I was like, well, I was trying to tell you, you know. I've got to say, man, watching him play the guitar is fucking unbelievable. He's such a, I mean, he's like properly way up there. When you hear it, his guitar bits on it, it's instantly recognisable as him. He was great to be in the studio with that day and just a great like burst of energy and kind of he's always really positive about stuff, about everything. We had a blast doing it and um, that could have been the centrepiece of the album. You know, it's such an epic and cinematic. I like The Mighty Eye. Uh, that's my favourite track. I saw him write it and he brought it in and I was like, oh, that's, that's uh, chord sequence wise a bit different than what he normally does. From working with him as long as I've worked with him, there's a format that I recognise and this was like a new thing, you know. He did it and he didn't think it was good enough. I didn't actually agree with him, I thought it was really good. But in retrospect, the version that we ended up with, I think is I'm glad it was this one and not the one that we did before. I can't be put on the spot and said, right, well, today you're in the studio with, you know, fucking whoever and we're going to write a song. I can't, I can't do it like that. They've all, they've got to fall out of the sky for me. I mean, the trick is always to be switched on and always to be ready for when, for when it falls out of the sky. Most of the songs that I start to write, I finish off in my head in the most innocuous of places, you know, in a doctor's waiting room, buying toothpaste, fucking, you know, parents' evenings. You know, because you're, kind of, you're kind of switched off. <laughs> a terrible thing to say, you're switched off at a parents' evening, but fucking hell, I am. Yeah, if I'm trying to write, I can never write. When I'm actually not trying to write at all, 
you know, I drive my fucking wife bananas. I could be out, you know, be out having something to eat, and be, she'll be like, "What are you, what are you doing?" You know, I'd be kind of tapping on the table and writing a, writing a song with the knife and the fork. It drives her insane, you know. And I was told the streets were paved with gold and there'd be no time for getting out when we I think this album is is different from any of the others he's done, that he's broadened his horizons. He's done it the right way, you know, he's just bit by bit, and bit but this is the broadest one that he's done. I'm really happy for him. I was waiting for this one. And it's braver, and it takes longer. But overall, I think it's, uh, it's got more of a classic record about it. It's never been a conscious thing for me. I really work on what songs I think are the best. Stylistically, it doesn't really come into it. If a song is great and it feels like nothing you've done before, then that's, that's brilliant. You know, if a song is great and it sounds like a thousand other th songs you've ever written, I don't give a shit about that as long as it's great. You know, I'm not bothered about that. If you put on a brand new pair of shoes, eventually they just mould to the shape of your feet because that's the fucking shape that you are, you know. And I guess your songs, or my songs, or one's songs, you know, they just end up like that, but I don't, I don't, I, would, I don't really shy away from anything like that. I, if anything, embrace it. <laughs> like the last album was, was to me, was an album, and it was a trip from start to finish. This is like a great TV series, and TV's better than movies, so they tell me these days. There's a load of geezers dressed in parkas who want you to carry on doing what it is they kind of missed out on. And it's an amazing thing when you see a next generation of Oasis fans and all that. And I respect that. And when I'm out and I'm touring, I play old stuff, you know, what I think they would like to hear. But when I go in the studio, I don't give a fuck what they want. I don't give a, I never, I never gave a fuck. I'd started chasing yesterday and I'd got to a point where I was happy with the songs and I'd done pretty good demos and I thought I'd get a producer and see if, if we can take it somewhere else. I arranged to meet him and I, I basically said, look, these tracks are done. There, there's no point, but I'd be really interested in doing a record if we started from scratch. He said, there's nothing for me to do, so I can't really get involved. And I was like saying to him, but well, I really want to make a record with you. And he said, well, if you want to make a record, then come to Belfast and we'll, we'll start a record. And, uh, and I said, well, what can, do you want to hear some of the songs? And he said, don't bring any songs, any songs you've got left or written, I'm not interested in. And I said, so what are we going to do when we get there? And he said, well, you know, we'll kind of work it out. I had a, I had a guitar and a bag of effects pedals and that was it. But by that point, he'd sold over 70 million albums. He had made countless records, and I knew how he worked, which was like a classic singer-songwriter. And for me, there was no point in recording that way. At this point in his career, he needed to sort of work in a very different way. So I just started going through my archive of, of records and, and, and stuff that I've bought specifically for inspiration and just started putting together a whole series of loops, just directions that I thought would be a great jumping off point for him and he, he really responded well to them. We set up a bunch of his guitar pedals and literally just hit the record button. got some games together, some city matches. He'd be touring, he seems to be touring all the time, and taking breaks to do Who Built the Moon. So when I'd see him, he'd, he'd tell me how that was going, actually, and working with David. What he was describing the record as being, or his process with David, was obviously very different from what he was doing on the first two records. He was very enthusiastic about it, I think, very excited. 
about you know, doing some, something in a different way. One thing I don't know if anyone talks about enough is how good Noel is as a guitarist. So that was really great. As an engineer, it's like everything's about the player. And, and Noel's really, really adept with the sonics. So, you know, everything that's on the album is pretty much what he did at the amp, not really anything afterwards. So he's really got a huge collection of guitar pedals and, and knows them all, which is like brilliant. And then can play and respond to them really, really well and with great time. So you get this sort of complete package sort of delivered to the mics, which kind of makes it really very easy to record him. Every time I meet him, I find out about all these new fantastic pedals because it's his addiction. I think it's sort of um, pedals sort of replaced his drug habit. The records that I've made previous to this have never required or I've never been inspired enough to really get into them and kind of seeing what this thing did. If I didn't get a sound out of it in 10 minutes, I'd kind of get bored and move on. On, the, on, like on, the, on this record, David is very into that and was kind of uh, pushing me to kind of, let's make this guitar not sound like a guitar and be creative with the technology. He just got it like straight away and all this gold just started sort of, you know, coming out of the amplifier and it was like, this is, this is really exciting. And we just started really just enjoying the process and not thinking too much about it. I don't know, maybe he thought I was more conservative in my taste than I am, you know what I mean? Which, I'm aware that most people do think that. You know, it, it was so loose. It was like, what does this pedal do? And what does that sound like? And, you know, then we would just record a bunch of stuff. You know, a lot of the time we didn't even know what it sounded like, but we knew it sounded good. And then by the end of that first week, I'd say two thirds of the album were done in that first five days. I think if you make a record that splits opinion, it, it's a good thing, as long as it's a good record. If you've been around a long time, you're always going to have people who are going to, you know, mouth off and have certain kinds of opinions if you sort of like, you know, break out of the norm a little bit. That's understandable, but people like to have a moan anyway. The spirit of what he does, I think, is, which is the key thing, is, is still there, you know. And the proof really is when you go to his gigs and the audience really do genuinely love the new stuff. Considering the kind of love that's there for his old stuff, he's doing all right. There was just a lot of things just fell out of the sky and landed on our lap, you know, we kind of like, we were really on a mission with this record and everybody was just trying to be as creative as possible, but ultimately make an album felt natural and right for Noel, do you know what I mean? It kind of, nothing actually happened that was kind of, you know, it's a very different record for him, but I think it was always coming, it was a, this, this record was always in the post. You know, it's, got a, it's just got a really, really positive kind of feeling. You know, it's like a modern sort of psychedelic record, you know. I, I, I don't think he'll be able to work any other way again, because it was actually really exciting for him, and sometimes a bit chaotic. But, you know, he could always see that we were getting these great results, and it just had to evolve naturally into what it sort of became. Fort Knox started from an actual conversation. We're talking about Kanye West. I don't know whether you're aware of a track by Kanye called The Power, which is fucking brilliant. I'm not, I'm not, I like Kanye as a, as a, as a dude. I think he's fucking amazing and hilarious. And it was like, let's do a track that's like that. No, like Noel has a, you know, he, he's got a pretty, you know, diverse palette when it comes to music and you know, I think on this album he was he was kind of just expressing a lot of that. It was the last thing that was recorded on the last day it came together. On the last day of it wasn't even going to go on the album. It, it's it. We got the backing track and we I did a few vocal ideas and they weren't really working and it was kind of like a bit meh. I don't know. And the way. Me and David both said at the outset, unless we're both 100% into what the tracks that we're doing, then they're not going on the record. We were still recording 
you know, in the week before the album was mixed. The process was constantly moving forward. You know, we would try uh, different instruments, uh, try different ideas. You know, some stuck, some didn't. So we had, we had uh, this girl called Audrey Bagweedy. She came in and we kind of got to do a few vocal things. She'd never heard the track before. And she started to do this Afrobeat thing on it. And we were both like, fucking hell, that's amazing. Uh, it all starts with this, uh, that ring uh, that I bought in East London, um, in Dawson. The, the woman uh, who was selling it uh, asked me what I was doing. I said I was a singer. She said I, she had a friend who worked in the industry. I should call him, maybe. So I, back home, I forgot about the little piece of paper, forgot about him, and three weeks later, maybe, I decided to, to, to call the, this guy after, after refining the, this little piece of paper. And um, he, he was not aware of uh, why I was calling and was not uh, really managing anyone any, anymore, so it was just a bit... Uh, uh, random call for him and then in the same day he actually called me back and said I have something for you and I, I just told him but you, you, don't, you don't know me we never met uh, we never met so how, how we come he said just just the feeling I have uh, this, this friend of mine David Holmes he uh, needs some French vocals on, on, a, on a record so let's meet tomorrow all just kind of fell into place on the last day and then it was even changing while we were mixing it and David said it's not gonna go on the album though and I went, it's going to be a fucking open track on the album. Uh, I would get there and Noel would be in sort of this strange uh, chamber and you would have to kneel and uh, chant some crazy thing he asks you to say and then he'd tap you on the shoulders and then you'd go in and you'd just start recording. Fort Knox, yeah, that's an amazing uh, like I was saying before, it's a bit of a, a film itself. It has a lot of scenes to it and is very, um, hip, it's hypnotic. And there's some like voodoo going on in that one for sure. Yeah. And the, the, I would try to turn it into a song and everyone's going, oh, it's great. And I was like, it's not working for me. And then when I dropped the vocals out and Audrey did a thing, it was like, ah, now it's like a, you know, a, a club, Chemical Brothers, Voodoo Ray, Big Beat, Anthem, baby. I think we might have exhausted all the music that we'd done and David said, right, have you got any riffs? And I was like, hmm, I don't know, like what? And that was another one that came out of a conversation about Can. And uh, I happened to have this one this one riff, and I said, oh, I've got this. Uh, we went into the live room, Emre, who's our engineer, is a brilliant drummer, fucking amazing drummer. And we just jammed it out for a bit. Noel was kind of playing a riff, and David just came and whispered in my ear, play a beat like this, and sort of, okay. And we did that, and I was like, that's never gonna work. And he was like, oh God, it worked great. <laughs> so, yeah, it was really, that was really cool. And Noel seemed to be into it, so he carried on and laid the whole track down. I only work from midday till six. I can't be asked working after six. And I can't be asked working before midday. Um, so I would just play for six hours. And then from six in the evening, he'd go and have dinner, I'd go home. And then he'd spend all night with Emre, you know, chopping it all up and saying, oh, that bit's good, and putting it kind of, kind of putting it all together, or he'd have someone to play me the next day. We weren't thinking about the shape of the track, you know, in terms of, like that's your intro and that's your verse and that's your bridge and chorus, etc., etc. It was more like, let's just find out what this is. Let's just keep on recording. And then through the editing process, we got a step further. There was always, always room for more experimentation. There's a big long gap. And he said, what are we gonna put there? And I said, well, let's, let's do some spoken word stuff which is what I was going to do on the amorphous androgynous record that never came out. There was going to be kind of bits of spoken word. And he said, well, what? And, I, and for some reason, 
I decided that it was going to be French. And I don't know, and I, I've no idea why I thought of that. And I had this amazing bit of French dialogue from an old, obscure, like avant-garde French film. And I've always wanted to use it. But obviously we couldn't use it, but the tone of it was right. It was like a, like a call to arms, like a real kind of like a missive, like a, an announcement through like a loudspeaker. He just said, um, would you be up for doing some vocal for Noel Gallagher? I was actually in the pub being really depressed and feeling sorry for myself on that day. And so um, it totally cheered me up. Attention, attention, which I think in English is watch out. Um, ladies and gentlemen, hold on tight and say your goodbyes. Um, humanity is melting at the poles, ladies and gentlemen. Um, borders are closing down. Um, breathe in, breathe out, carbon monoxide. Relax and rest in peace. It's only the end of the world. I mean, you know, yeah, it's easy um, to get inspired when you're writing something like this because you just have to like read BBC News and you know. But um, it was written really quickly, like uh, over breakfast. So it's not like it's not like me to sanction anything like this, which is kind of going on about the end of the world which fit with the track, because the track is, is it, it'll all become apparent when you see the video. I can't actually believe I'm actually saying that, because I fucking loathe videos and everything about them. But it will become apparent when you see the video, because it's a bit of a sarcastic song about, well, is it a beautiful world, you know, with all these, these ISIS ruffians, you know, and Donald Trump and um, Kim Jong-un and his nasty rockets. You have one new message. Yes, regarding my announcement I do on a beautiful world, I just realised that Noel doesn't speak French at all. I think he knows Oulala and Monstu. Yes, I was just thinking like live, I could be saying anything. I mean, I could, I could be telling people that his new record is dangerous for the soul, that they should like run away. He wouldn't know, would he? He wouldn't have a clue. Um, okay, bye. Not every week, every month, and sometimes every week, someone says to me, you know Gallagher, right? And uh, I've told him this, I was, I was like, I am obviously not no, right? But it's because I look like a guitar player, and he, the, so he's become the sort of generic term for rock musician. And, uh, and the other thing about him as well is like, uh, he's, he's, if you say, uh, well, what are you doing? Someone says to me, what are you doing? I say, I'm working with Noel. You don't have to say Gallagher anymore, you just say no. So he's become like, he's become one of those people who he's, he's, uh, you just have the one name now, like Madonna. An album of mine wouldn't be an album of mine without Johnny Marr being involved in it. Now it goes without saying that I love Johnny Marr's guitar playing, but what I love equally is his harmonica playing and I think the riff at the beginning of uh, uh, Hand in Glove is fucking, it kills me every time. And um, I called him, I said, can you come and play some, he played on a few tracks. Uh, most of the stuff he played never quite made it. But then we ended up focusing on this one track, which we didn't think he was going to play on. And I said, do you fancy playing a bit of harmonica? He looked a bit taken aback, you know. On both the albums, he said to me, oh, I'll send you the track, and I, I, oh, I always say to him, no, 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 let me just react to what I hear straight off. It might sound wrong at first, but I didn't want to overthink it. I think, in my case, I just wanted to react to the music, but with the, If Love Is The Law, and he definitely wanted, uh, he had a, a harmonica sound in mind, and I play it a certain kind of way, uh, which is to say very simply, it's the only way I can do it. And um, I was kind of pretty gobsmacked when I heard the song, to be honest with you. It doesn't, not only does it not sound like 
you, you would know it was Noel, particularly when you hear the vocal on it. It's a really strong vocal. But when I heard it, it was like, wow, this is not like really something else that I know anyone else is doing at the moment. Um, although I think it's a fantastic song. I think it's a, my favourite song on the record, so I'm very pleased to be on that on that particular song and to be asked to play harmonica as well is, is really, really fantastic for me because I used to play it a lot in the Smiths and in the, the, I haven't played it for a while. Um, and it works really well on the track, very simple part. When it, when it kicks in, in the middle bit of this track, it fucking kills me every time. He's an astonishing fucking dude. I, I believe that as musicians, I think you are what you play. And I think it's interesting with Noel because um, he's a person who's very, um, he's quite a private person, I think. Even though he's very well known and a lot of people feel like they know him, as an actual person, he's, he's, I think he's quite private. Very pragmatic and quite a no-nonsense kind of guy. But when you listen to his music and say, Love is, if love is the law is a good example, it does a thing which basically says life is great, life is worth living and I guess you know it's that phrase life affirming. It's interesting because he's not the sort of person who will be running around hugging everybody or oh, I've seen him do that once or twice but don't tell anyone. You hear it in his music, you are what you play and you hear it and if Love's the Law is, is, is from the first time I heard it was just complete rush of this upbeat, wide open, open skies, um, affirmation of life. Really. I get it, because I'm from the north and, you know, obviously quite, you know, I guess I look like a musician. Duh. I get the, uh, you're from Manchester then, aren't you? Aye. You were, uh, I had duh, uh, and I know what they're going to say. I had duh, uh, Nolan Mockeb a few, few weeks ago. Great, top, top guy. I won't tell you what the rest of the conversation goes like. But, uh, top man, top man. Are you mates with him, are you? Right, were you in Oasis? It's like, oh, that's a long story, mate. It's a long story. Oh.